Well, praise the Lord, family. How's everybody doing tonight? Uh, as you may have noticed, I'm not Pastor Dumpkins. I'm the other guy. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be with you tonight. My name is Pastor Caleb, Caleb Brown, assistant pastor here at Shallow Baptist Church, and this is our Bible study night. Amen. Pastor Dumpkins has many things to do, so for the next three weeks, we're going to be together. Amen. So grab somebody, call somebody, text somebody, let them know we're going to be discussing an exciting Bible study tonight that I hope will change some things in your life, that I hope will touch you. Amen. But before we get into it, before I give you the title, I want to pray, and then we're going to move right into the, uh, the, the lesson tonight. And I hope that you, uh, once you hear this, that you take the proper action to change whatever you need to change in order to get in line with God. Amen? So, let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to give you all the glory and the praise. If it had not been for you, Lord, we wouldn't be here. If it had not been for you, Lord, we wouldn't be saved. If it had not been for your blood, Jesus, you wouldn't be stolen our sins and trespasses. So we just want to say thank you for allowing us to be here. And for those who are listening, those who are watching by way of YouTube and Facebook, I pray, Lord, that the Spirit, your Spirit, would touch them wherever they are right now. We just want to give you all the glory. We bind every spirit in this place is not like you. I humble myself before you and your people. Holy Spirit, speak. Speak tonight to every person who's hearing and those who will hear later this, this lesson to help us be better people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Tonight, I want to start a discussion with you. Amen. It's just, it's just us in the room right now. I want to discuss, uh, there's certain people that uh, cause you and I to, in some cases, stress. Sometimes it causes anxiety. It causes worry. They place us in positions where we feel like we need to defend ourselves. They place us in positions where we need to, you know, say things we normally wouldn't say. Uh, under certain conditions. If we were just being ourselves without someone pushing our buttons, we wouldn't say certain things or do certain things. Amen? But there are people in the world today that is becoming more and more uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's, they're here. They're becoming more and more present. We're seeing them more and more each day. Matter of fact, you can you run into them at the wall, Walmart. You run into them at Wawa. You, you have to deal with them at your job. You have to deal with them in, even in your home. And unfortunately, sometimes you have to deal with them in church. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about difficult people. Difficult people exist everywhere. And we have to learn how to navigate through these choppy waters where people are bringing us all kinds of issues and things that's causing us, in some cases, to act out of character. And I want to help you tonight to learn how, this is the title of our class tonight, how to deal with difficult people without becoming one. Listen to that now. How to deal with difficult people without becoming one. Each and every one of us have a decision to make after tonight. You can either go away of your flesh and allow the flesh to answer the people who have, who have been pressing you, or you can say, Lord, I need to know how to do this, what, how to walk in, in your spirit and learn how to walk in obedience and learn how to walk in such a way I'm not becoming difficult. Now, why, why, why this lesson? I, I heard you. Why this lesson? Why is this important? You see, we're living in a time now where it seems like the division, the schism between us is growing wider and wider. Racism, ageism. We have all kinds of stuff on the vaxxers, anti-vaxxers. Get your vaccine. No, don't get your vaccine. Wear a mask. No, don't wear a mask. And these, these things are causing people to really act out. We have the rise of the Karens in the world. I know some of y'all heard about it, right? Those individuals who get in other people's business not being asked, come, and they circumvent, they, not circumvent, they, 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 just, they just come in and they install themselves in other people's business and without anyone even asking them a question. They want to tell you what to do, how you want to act, what you should say, where you should say it, when you should say it. And so we, learn, we need to learn how to deal with difficult people without becoming one. Amen? So, 
I want to do three things with this lesson. Tonight, I want to define the, the lesson about difficult people, what the Bible has to say. I want to uh, uh, talk about how do we actually deal with them and the examples that Jesus has given us as to how we should deal with difficult people. Because you see, he dealt with difficult people throughout his life. And so he gives us the example of, as to how we ought to deal with people who become contrary, argumentative, those who want to just cause all kinds of strife. He shows us how to do it from the, from, the, uh, from the Bible, from his character, from his life. We can find out how to deal with difficult people. And at the, the last class, what I want to do is teach you, talk to you about how to set up boundaries. We mentioned this in a couple of messages a, a few weeks ago, and we've never really delved into it. Because you see, every single one of us need to learn how to set boundaries to, to keep people from coming but so close. And it's okay to tell people, no, I'm not going to go there. No, I'm not going to engage. No, I'm not going to do certain things. Because if we don't set up boundaries, what happens is we begin to live a life that doesn't even belong to us. I hope you're hearing. So I'm going to try to take my time. Even though I only have three weeks, I do have a lot to say. But I want to make sure that you get what I'm saying. Amen? So pray for me and pray with me as we go through this, all right? So first off, let's define the term difficult people. What does that, what does the Bible have to say about difficult people? Well, as I already said, difficult people are everywhere. They're hostile, rude, mean, selfish, impatient, uncaring, and even worse in some cases. Look at what the Bible has to say. If you grab your Bible, grab your device, wherever you are, grab a pen and piece of paper. You can start writing some scriptures down. Amen? First passage of scripture I want to look at is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Amen? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Actually, 1 to 5. Look what it says. But mark this. There will be terrible times, or in some of your scripture, it's perilous times, in the last days. The last days. I want you to check that. In the last days. This is what's going to be the marks or, 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 or indicators that we're in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Do you know anybody like that? Lovers of money. Hmm. Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Uh-oh. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not, not lovers of, of good, of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, Lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. Having the form of godliness, but denying his power. And look what, look what Paul said in this. Have nothing to do with such people. You see, when we, when we converse or we uh, allow ourselves to be in the presence of people like this, if we don't put boundaries up, if we don't put ourselves in check, we can become like them. See, that's the real question I want to get to tonight. We have a way of identifying who's difficult, but have we identif identified the difficulties in ourselves? Have we looked in the mirror lately? You see, I can call out someone else who's abusive, call out someone else who's rash, call out someone else who's conceited, but have I looked at myself? You see, before I can determine who's difficult, and before I can determine who I should, who I should converse with or who I should allow into my life, I have to make sure that my heart is right. Amen? I might as well just, just break it right now. I might as well just tell you straight up. I have issues with this. I, God's telling me to tell you, but at the same time, he's telling me to get myself in check because I don't always deal with difficult people sometimes. I'm the one who become difficult. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. So we don't want to be honest, but if we're ever going to get, be, be delivered and if we're ever going to be real to our calling, if we're ever going to be real to our faith, we have to make sure that we first deal with us. So before I can turn around point fingers, I have to first look at, at the scriptures and let the scriptures, the word of God, filtrate through me and let God tell me where I am. David said, Lord, Lord know me, examine me, and, and, and put me on a, 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 a straight path. God, David knew that he had issues and he needed God to help him with those issues. Amen? So we've seen here in, in uh, 2 Timothy, the uh, third chapter, where 
the, it, it, the signs of the last days. And we see people who love them, of themselves, but also look at something else here. I want you to look at, uh, I want you to see Jeremiah 17 and 9. It says, For uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? You see, Sometimes we deceive ourselves in believing that it's the other guy. Amen, somebody. It's the other person that needs to change. We, you know, we, we get relationships and, we, and the man thinks he's going to change the woman and the woman thinks he's going to change the man. And a lot of times we look at people and see something in them that we don't like and they don't realize they're only mirroring what's in us. When we get upset with our children, sometimes our children are only reflecting back what we have already placed in them. Amen? So if we find our children being difficult, because there's difficult children in the home, there's difficult relationships, husbands and wives, there's difficult people on the job, as I already said, and difficult people in the church. But before I can say who is difficult, have I checked myself? Amen. Amen. So, if I'm saying someone else is hostile, am I hostile? If I'm saying someone else is rude, am I being rude? And, and when I'm saying someone else is, is impatient or uncaring, am I those things? That's what, I, that's what we want to get at tonight. We have to look at ourselves so then I can move forward. Because you see, I believe God is doing something. I believe God is calling his people out right now. I really do. I believe that he's saying it's time for us to be different. So we can make a difference. I believe God is calling us to, to be holy as he is holy. Because you see, right now, the, the, the world don't know who is the real Christian or not. The world needs to know that there's a definite difference in God's people and those who are not. And right now, the, the lines have become blurred. And I believe God's calling out from among them so we can represent him in these last days because somebody needs to be standing up and glorifying God. In the presence of this wickedness, we need to let people know that God is real and that he's the only alternative to life everlasting for true hope. Amen? Let's look at some more scriptures. Look over here in Matthew chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 19. Write it down. I, I, I know I'm going a little quick, but... Write them down. Matthew chapter 15, verse 19. And look what it says here. For out of the heart mm, come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat what with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. You see, the, the, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes were saying that, talking about Jesus' people, about the eating, without, eating without washing their hands. And so Jesus had to, had to let them know. It has nothing to do with the external. You see, we put a lot of emphasis on the external and devalue what's internal. We, we put a lot of emphasis on what we can see and put very little value on what cannot be seen. God is saying, I want you to understand, it's, it, I'm looking at your heart. It's your heart that matters. It's what, what, what is working and what's happening in your heart. Because, you see, we know we can identify what's in your heart by what comes out your mouth. Amen. I know, I know y'all don't like me right now. But that's okay because you're going to get to some good stuff in a minute. All right? So just hold on. We're going somewhere. All right? Stay with me on this ride. Stay with me on this journey because I, I, you and I both need this. Amen? Tell yourself I need this. All right? So, so he said... Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We need to know what's in our own hearts. So before I can go and talk about someone else being difficult, another word I like to throw in there while I'm there, that there are people who are toxic. Toxic people. Toxic people. Acidic people. Who, people who can, can damage you because they watch this. They, they, they have like a snake bite. Once that venom gets in your system, it's hard to get out. And these individuals can cause you to not only lose sleep, but they can cause you, watch this, they can cost you health. Because we internalize some of the things that they say about us, some of the things they have done to us, and if we don't release it, 
it becomes something that consistently hinders us from being able to move forward and hinders us from being able to understand who God is and hinders us from being able to grow. So God is saying there's some people you have to just release from your life. Amen? And we're going to talk about that in a minute. So what God is telling me to tell, say to us tonight, don't forget where we came from. Before I can talk about anybody else, before I can determine who's difficult, I must look at myself first. So look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to, 1 to 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. This is Bible study, so we're going to need you to turn some pages right now, okay? I need you to go through your phone make sure you, you get to the address right now. Write it down so you can read it for later, all right? Don't forget where we came from. And you were dead in trespasses and sin. This is... Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And you were dead in trespasses and sin. Notice past tense. God speaking of the present situation in a, in a past tense. You were dead in trespasses and sin. You overstepped boundaries. You went beyond what God said. You, you, you had no desire to follow God. I don't know about you, but that's where I was. All right? Had no desire to follow God. Didn't want to do what God said. And even though folk had told me about him, I wasn't listening. Amen? Because I was too, I was dead. I had no spiritual activity whatsoever, not when it came to the things of God. All right? Uh, so he said, you were dead in your trespasses in, in which you once walked. That word walk, we lived in it. We, 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 we were, that's, that's where our address was, dead street. Amen? We, that's where we lived. We, we, were, we were actually living in a, in, a, in a graveyard and didn't even realize it. We were actually zombies and didn't even realize it. We had, we had physical activity with no spiritual life. Amen? And following the course of the world, in other words, you did what everybody else did. Whatever felt good to us, whatever felt right to us, whatever, felt, whatever we wanted. If I want to cut somebody out, I want to fight, we did all that. Drank it hot, did all that. And I know some of you did too. Amen? Some of you did too. You, you, you don't have to tell me. I don't know. I already picked you out. All right? And, and we were following. Here's, here's who we were following. We were following the prince of the world, prince of the air. We were following the devil, the spirit that now is where work in the sons of disobedience. We were the sons of disobedience. So that means we had no relationship with God at all. We had, we, we had, we, we, we didn't consider anything to be out of reach. We did whatever we wanted to do. As long as it felt good and looked right, we did it. Right? Am I telling the truth? Amen. So, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Our old nature was in link with the world and the devil, and we did what felt right. But it was wrong before God. Let's look what he says. He said, with passions carry out the desires of the body and the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. By nature. Y'all better hear what I'm saying right now. I'm giving you a reason right now why we should walk in obedience to God. That God said, you are by nature. You should have been under my judgment. We should have been under the judgment of God. But his grace is what saved us. His grace is what delivered us. Because of his grace we're standing here tonight. Because of his grace you're listening to this word tonight. So we ought to want to change, not just because of uh, 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 what people might say about us, but because his grace was sufficient for us so that he can give us the ability to overcome whatever barriers come up in our life and we don't have to stay the way we were. We don't have to go back to where we were. We can go ahead and lift up our heads and lift up our hands and say, Lord, thank Thank you because I'm not what I was. I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way. Amen, somebody. I'm on my way. I, you were dead. Past tense. You once walked. Past tense. Among whom you used to live. Past tense. No longer children of wrath. Thank you, Lord. He's given us a reason why we should challenge ourselves and, 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 and not become the difficult people that we often have to come in come in uh, a touch with. Amen? We live in a fallen world filled with sinful people. We must remind ourselves of this fact so that, that we are not surprised when we encounter difficult people. You shouldn't be surprised when you're in the line sometimes and somebody says something out of, out of, out of pocket. They say something that they shouldn't. 
All right? Shouldn't be surprised because we live in a sin-filled world. We shouldn't be surprised by the things that's going on. As a matter of fact, we, did anybody see that, what happened at the Golden Corral over in Pennsylvania? Where they stopped, I believe it was in Pennsylvania, where they decided they're going to pick up chairs and throw chairs and they're throwing glasses, kids flying, everything's all the tables and everything else. And what, what, what started this? Somebody didn't like the fact that somebody got the steak first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's in the news. You go to YouTube and check it out. Two people that decided to get a steak. One said, I want mine medium, uh, 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 rare. And the other one said, I want mine well done. Well, the one that got, well, got the rest, they got his first. Makes sense, right? Medium, you want yours well done. It's going to take longer. But this guy said, I want my steak at the same time. They decided to start fighting over steak. And there was a pan it was pandemonium. It went crazy. Look at what's going on in, in Philadelphia right now. Look what's going on in other states. And look what's going on in our government. Don't tell me we're not living in the last days. And there is, is in a need for somebody to stand up and be distinctive from all this crazy stuff that's going around here. It's time for the people of God to come out and stand up and be and be, be recognized as people who serve and follow God. Amen. We live in a sin-filled world. And people, but, but watch this. But people are not the problem. You just got my pastor. You just got them talking about difficult people, talking about me being difficult. So you being difficult. Now, that's not the real problem. Ephesians chapter 6 is a real problem. Okay? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 14. Here's where we find the real problem. Because when we focus on the people, we focus on the external, we fail to realize there's a spiritual realm, there's a spiritual entity, there's a spiritual, there's a, there's a, there's a spiritual problem. Amen? And so when we, when we just focus on the external, we fail to delve into the spiritual aspect of it and, and, and find answers there. That's what you're going to find. And see, everything is based on the Spirit of God. Everything is based on the world that exists outside of this one. Amen? So look at this. It says in Ephesians chapter, chapter 6, verse 10, notice what Paul said. I'm reading from the Amplified Version, all right? I'm going to read a few verses, so hang with me. Uh, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord. Be empowered through your union with him. Be empowered through your union with him. You draw strength from your relationship with God. Amen? That's the only way we can draw strength enough to overcome these things that's coming up in our lives and these difficulties, difficult times, and difficult people. I must draw strength from God. Draw your strength from him. Listen to me. That strength which is boundless, <laughs> boundless. He provides boundless strength. Amen? Put on God's whole armor, the armor of a he heavy armed soldier, which God supplies. Amen, somebody. Somebody say, I'm in a war. And in a war, you may face some skirmishes. You're going to face some times where you may have a respite. You know, and seem like everything is quiet and nothing's going on. But don't ever get lulled into belief that you're not in a battle. Just because you have times where you can rest your head and everything's going well, the bills are paid, the kids are acting right, don't think you're not in a war because you're constantly in a war. This is warfare and you need to be strapped every time you get it. That's why the Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God. You can't afford to leave anything behind. Amen? Look what it says. That you may be able to successfully stand up against all the strategies and deceits of the devil. Now here it is. For we wrestle not with flesh and blood. I'm not contending with physical opponents. Not only physical opponents. I'm not contending with the person on the job who don't sit here and drop my name through the dirt and talk and trash about. That's not the problem. It's the spirit behind them. And if I don't talk to that spirit, if you don't talk to that spirit, if you don't ask God to deal something about that spirit, we're going to always be fighting with the flesh. And eventually, because of where we came from, I'm fleshly at times. I'm, I'm, I'm the, my old nature will step up, and so does yours. And, and, and when your old nature steps up towards, towards someone who is fleshly by nature, then watch, watch this. God has to deal with both of us. I'd rather get out of God's way and let him deal with that person and say, Lord, just help me to keep my mouth shut. 
Today I've been walking around because of this lesson. I, the past few days, I've been walking around, people saying stuff going like this. Mm, 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 don't you say nothing. This is what's wrong with you. I'm just not saying nothing on that. I'm just going to leave that one alone. Because you're trying to pull me into something. I, I want to say something, but no, mm, 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 I'm practicing keeping my mouth shut. Amen. Matter of fact, you can you can you can go ahead and, and put that down and say, tell somebody. Practice keeping your mouth shut. Because if you do, if you do, you may find yourself not getting in as much trouble. Amen. That's for free. Alright? So he said, put on the whole armor of God, the armor of heavy armed soldier which God supplies, that you may be able to successfully stand against all the strategies of the devil. God gives you the ability to overcome whatever the devil throws at you. Then he says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Okay? And notice what he says here. But we wrestle against powers, principalities, and rules of the air. And, and, and I want you to look at this down here in verse 13. Therefore, put on God's complete armor that you may be able to risk, resist and stand your ground on the evil day of danger. And having done all the crisis demands, stand. Firmly in your place. Stand, therefore, and hold your ground. Now, I found out something here. That after the after you fought as hard as you could, after you, you strapped, you got your, you have, you have your breastplate on, you have your belt of truth, you have all that, you have the feet, your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, you have your sword in your hand and, and you have a, and, and a shield of faith, you have your helmet on you, and you're fighting as hard as you can, but you don't seem to be progressing. There's times where you can be praying hard as you can. The you get quoting the factual fervent prayer of a righteous man, a devil of much, but you don't seem to get any further. And God said, what I want you to do at that point, after you've done everything you could do, after you've done all that you can, stand. Don't push, don't allow the enemy to push you back any further. Don't allow him to take any ground that you already overcome. Don't allow him to put you back in a position where you feel like you're, you're, you're envious of somebody, you're, you're jealous, you're angry all the time. Don't allow him to push you back. You came from there, you won that territory, you got that land, now stand. But then he says, after you've done all that, he says, to withstand. Stand firmly, but he says, withstand. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He's saying, you know what, I found this out, blew my mind. He said, don't, when you're in a situation like that, don't change. Stand. Don't change. In other words, don't let the situation make you into something that you're not. Don't allow the pressure to push you into becoming someone who you already overcome. Don't allow the pressure, and don't allow the naysayers, the gainsayers, don't allow those people who always step in the back, make you turn around and become somebody that you no longer are. Don't allow them to push you back in a position where you become that argumentative person, that acidic person, that toxic person that you were. You came out of that, now don't change. You haven't progressed. You're still fighting, you're standing, but, but he said, in the midst of that, don't become someone else. Don't become something else. You, you don't change. You're, even though the situation may not change, don't you change. You keep fighting the good fight of faith. You keep standing on, 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 on what you believe God is telling you. You don't, you don't, you don't throw in the towel because things are getting rough. Amen? Things are getting difficult and people around you are getting more difficult. He's saying, don't change. Now I have a question. I'm going to slow it down a little bit, all right? Sweating up here. Why would God allow difficult people in our life in the first place? Why would he allow people who have rage issues, abusive those who have a tendency to lie on you and about you, lie to you. Why would God allow certain people who are in your life and mine? Does he have a purpose for people like this? I would like to tell you the answer is absolutely. God has a purpose for people like this in our lives. And I want to show you an example from the scriptures. It's found in Judges chapter 3. It's found in Judges chapter, chapter, um, chapter 3. Judges chapter, I can't speak tonight. Judges chapter 3. 
looking at verse 1 to 3. Now these are the nations. Somebody say nations. More than one. Nations. Matter of fact, we're five. Nations. Which God, with the Lord, Jehovah, the self-existing God, the I am that I am, the one who could do something if he wanted to about the, the plethora of enemies in the life of his people. He could have done something. He could have, he could have limited them. He could have, have, he could have eliminated them. He could have put a barrier around them so they could not get to them. But the Bible says he left these nations. He left them there. Right? God did this. And then why did it? To prove. To prove. To prove Israel by them. And even as many nations had not, had not known uh, wars. Okay, let me park it there for a moment. God left them to prove them, to test them, to try them. God left them there to help them to understand those who did not understand how to fight, to teach them how to go to war. God left them there because, you see, anything of value, say gold, before it, 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 it's put out, before it's able to be used in a, as a piece of jewelry, they have to first mine for the gold. They have to first dig for the gold, right? They have to, they go through a process of sifting the gold because you see it has some material connected to it that it needs to, that it needs to be separated from, amen? And then they go through a melting, smelting process where they melt down the gold so that all the impurities in the gold will be separated from the gold. And watch this. As the impurities rise, the gold settles. <laughs> As the impurities rise, the gold settles. And God's saying that our faith, our faith is like pure gold. You go to James chapter 1, and God's talking about the, about, about the fact that the, the trying of our faith. He's, he, he said, let the trial work what it's supposed to work. He's trying to purify our faith. Amen. Like gold needs to be purified. Our faith needs to be purified because we have some stuff still mingling in us. We have some things that are still connected to us. And so you have to put us in the smelter. The smelter. You have to put us in, 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 this, in this, this cauldron to uh, 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 call life and difficulty, stress, and people. He put people around us to try to, watch this, extract what's in us so we become better at worship, better at, at, at being the people of God. You see, certain things can't come out of us unless there's problems in our lives. And God will use people to bring out the problems that's in us. Amen. To bring that stuff out of us. So, let me say this for free. You, you might as well just stop trying to bind the devil up. You might as well just quit, quit talking about what, uh, 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 you know, uh, you, you just going to plead the blood. Because if it's God who's the one who left this, these people and these issues in your life, there's no praying your way out of it. You got to learn how, what is God doing? What is God trying to teach you so that he can walk you through it so you'll be better once you come out of it? Amen. But I like those that are coming out. Amen? But look at this. It says that these are the generations of the children that they might know to teach them war. You see, these are the, the generations that grew up in the wilderness. You remember, they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And these individuals had babies in the wilderness. They raised families in the wilderness. They, they, they grew up in the wilderness. But one thing they did not understand the, the, that the Joshua generation before them, the elders before them, they did not know how to fight. And so God is saying that he's trying to teach his people how to fight. Amen, somebody. I'm working on the message right now. I'm probably messing myself up by, by even mentioning it. But uh, I'm working on something that, that, that's entitled so far. Uh, probably going to change, right? Probably going to change now. But uh, the title is Fight Like a Christian. Fight like a believer. You see, true believers know how to fight the spiritual warfare. Matter of fact, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You see, we, we've been fighting, but oftentimes we think the fight lies in the way we used to. You see, back in the day, and there's some people who still remember, I, I just throw hands. I, I, I 
had hands. I could do a little few things, with, you know, and because I was and mentally I wasn't always there. Just you push me too far, and that was it. I lose it. Okay. I thank God I'm not that person anymore. But just because you knew how to fight out in the street, don't mean you know how to fight now. You see, uh, it was Paul that said here in Second Corinthians chapter ten. He says. Yeah, he says down here in verse 3, but though we live in the world, and this is the NIV, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. We don't fight the way everybody else do. We don't fight with our hands and words. We don't fight by being argumentative and being contrary. Amen? We don't fight and try to cause all kinds of divisions and schisms in our home. Amen? We, we don't fight like that. We can't win the real battle, I told you, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We, we're, in a, we're in a spiritual battle, therefore we need spiritual weaponry. Amen? We need spiritual weaponry. He says, uh, the we verse 4 says, the weapons of our, of our fight or of our warfare are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. Again, I'm reading the NIV. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. Amen. To the pulling down of strong. The weapons we have can demolish, destroy the strongholds that the devil has placed in our life. Some of us have strongholds of fear. Some of us have strongholds of anxiety and depression. These things can come down when we learn how to use the weapons that God gave us. One of the weapons God gave us about to mess up. He gave us the ability to pray. A true Christian warrior wins from their knees. Y'all better hear what I'm saying. You win from your knees. When you're on your knees and praying and talking to God, the one who created everything, the one who is the author and finisher of your faith, when you get to the position where you say, Lord, I need strength, real spiritual strength, you fall on your knees and you don't worry about what other people think, what other people say. You go and find yourself a closet where you can get in. You find yourself a secret place where you can hide and then you start speaking to your God. And when you start speaking to your God about your situation, he may tell you exactly what to do. He may tell you to stand still and, and just see my salvation. He may tell you don't worry about it. He may tell you just keep on praying. But whatever it is, you're going to find strength from your knees. You better hear me. We have to learn how to use our weapons. Well, our weapons is also the weapon of worship. We don't worship God in the way we should. We wait till we get to church and then we we'll raise our hand. No, God expect us to raise our hand. Whether you're in your car, whether you're on the job, sometimes I have to go in the bathroom and say, "Lord, help me, Jesus, help me, Lord," and then begin to worship. And sometimes in the midst of your worship, when you start thinking about where you were and where you could have been, God sometimes will allow tears. Because you realize just how good he's been. I'm preaching now. I'm not supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be teaching something. Okay, listen to me here. So, 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 so we need to understand that God is the one. Sometimes we will leave those those contrary people in your life because he's trying to get something out of you. It's the it's watch this now. It's sandpaper. It's sandpaper that makes us move. <laughs> You're gonna catch it in a minute. It's sandpaper. That can make stuff. If you ever took sandpaper against wood, you would go ahead and start smoothing out the wood with the rough sandpaper. You can't take another piece of wood and rub them together. That creates fire. But if you want to, if you want to go and smooth it out, you're going to need some sandpaper, something rough. And so God says, I got to smooth off those rough edges in you. So I have to use something rough. To go ahead and, 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 and file that, that area down. That's why over in Second Chronicles, the Second Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul was talking about the fact that he had a thorn in his flesh. Notice what he said about this thorn. He said, it was a thorn given to me to buffet me, to beat me up by Satan. So wait a minute, hold up. It was Paul looked at this because of the, the because of the things he's seen. Because of the, uh, he was lifted up into heaven and the things he said, God says, I don't want your head getting big. So I'm paraphrasing. So he had to send him something to keep him, home, keep him humble. What does God have to send into your life to keep you humble? To keep you from becoming difficult? Maybe that person who you keep trying to get away from, but like a bad painting that keeps showing up. Maybe that's the person. 
The one who has you just want to get mad all the time. It's, it's working your last nerve. Maybe God is saying that they're the one that I'm using to smooth the rough edges in your life. Notice what else he said here. I'm not done. He said, uh, he, to teach them the war, at least as such before, knew nothing thereof. They didn't know anything about it. They didn't know how to fight at all. And when we get saved, when we first get into this, to, to this thing called Christianity, when we first accept Jesus Christ, we have no clue. We have no clue as to what's really going to come down the road. That's why we sometimes we're surprised. People don't tell us sometimes that you're going to, you have times where you're going to just feel like you're about to lose your mind and, and saved. There's going to be times you're going to feel like you just want to give up and still and saved. This time you're going to feel like you're saying, I don't know what's going on. What is God doing? I don't get it. And still saved. Amen, somebody. There's times when you don't know what to think. They don't tell you that. They tell, there's those, you know, especially those on TV, they tell you just go ahead and uh, give and God's going to bless you tremendously. I don't gave, I'm still broke. Amen, somebody. I, I, don't, I don't did all those things. I prayed and things didn't go the way I want. I'm trying to keep it real tonight. Amen? Because God is trying to get us to go beyond those things. That we don't get so caught up in things. Because he wants us more concerned with our relationship with him than the things that he gives us. God can give you a million dollars, a billion dollars if you want to. Right now, if you want to, he can make it happen. But that's not, that's not his M.O. That's not, he didn't come to do that. He came to save us and change us. Amen? I, I was telling somebody the other day, I said, uh, it was Deion Sanders that said, Money only makes you more of who you are. If, you, if you're a knucklehead, you're going to be a bigger knucklehead with more money. So it's not about the money. But the Bible says, what does a prophet man gain the whole world and lose his soul? So it's not about the things we have. Amen? If you don't get anything else tonight, that's, I want you to think about that. It's not about the things we have. God is trying to position us to be better so that we can glorify him in the midst of a crazy world. All right? So... And then he says that he left them there, verse 4, that to, he proved Israel by them to, again, smooth them out, train them, to, or rather test them, put them on trial, right? To test them for the genuineness of their relationship with God, right? And he said uh, that they, whether they were hawking unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded them by their father's hand, by, by, by the hand of Moses, rather. Uh, so, so he said, I left them there to see if they're going to listen to me. Now, understand something. God, who's on mission, already knows. Because later on, if you read the text in, in, in uh, Judges chapter 3, you read the rest of the text, they fell miserably. They were supposed to fight against the Philistines. They were supposed to learn how to fight against all these individuals who, were, who surround the five nations that God left. They were not supposed to assimilate themselves with them. They were supposed to stay holy and distinct. But instead, they, they, they started giving their daughters in marriage, and they, get, and, and they were married. They were, they were marrying the, uh, their daughters and bringing them all in. They became assimilated, they became one with them, and then they began to serve their God. And the Bible says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against them because they didn't fight. They didn't obey. And God says the test was to see if you're going to do all these things and you fail miserably. I don't want to fail the test. Somebody say, I don't want to fail the test. I don't want to anger God because I don't want to be, because I don't want to be obedient to what I already know. Now look at this. He says, uh, the second thing I want to talk about how do God use difficult people? How does, what, what is God? We see here that he used people, but what else does he do? do? What else does he do uh, 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 to, uh, in, in conjunction with using difficult people in our life? In other words, what is his purpose? Okay, first, dealing with difficult people provides, dealing with difficult people provide fresh opportunities to, to display humility. In other words, when difficult people come into our lives and we learn how to hold our peace, amen, that's demonstrating humility. God will provide difficult people in our lives so we have opportunity to demonstrate humility. Uh, Proverbs 3 and 34. He mocks proud mockers, 
those who always have something to say, those who always stand up against what God has to say. He says, he mocks proud mocks, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. Those who've been pressed and pushed down by society, those who walk in humility, God says, I show you my favor. And that's good news right there. Because when we have the favor of God, that means I have the strength of God, I have the provision of God, I have the presence of God when God shows us favor. Notice what else he says here in James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives us more grace. Oh, someone say thank you, Jesus. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to them and he gives us more grace. That's what I need because you see, I told you, I'm one of those individuals that can be difficult. I know it, but I also have enough sense to know, Lord, help me. Lord, I understand me. Lord, I'm, I, I, I'm fully connected with who I was and who I am, and I'm hoping to be what you want me to be. I'm trying my best to get there. I need your help, Lord. He says, don't worry, you got the grace for it. You see, one thing we need to learn how to do when dealing with difficult people, understanding our own hearts, that I should be gracious towards other people because they may be going, not maybe, if you're dealing with another brother or sister in the, in the Lord, they're going through a process themselves. So instead of us getting hard on one another, instead of putting down one another, instead of sitting here acting like we can't commune with one another, we can't converse with one another, what we want to do is say, you know what? I understand. Therefore, I'm going to show you grace as God show me grace. Hallelujah. We need more gracious, more grace, uh, uh, grace givers, grace givers in the house of God. If we can learn to demonstrate grace towards one another, when people from the world come in and see this type of love, this type of grace that we give each other, that we don't hold grudges, that we let some stuff go and we are forgiving people. Amen, somebody. That's what God expects for us. It, that's the contrary to being difficult because you difficult people do not want to forgive. We're going to talk more about that next week. Difficult people always want to hold on and watch this. They all, always want to extract revenge. They want to get you back. They, want, they always want you to have to pay for what you've done. Difficult people never want to let you off the hook. If you said something wrong, if you did something wrong, back in the day you was out there, you were not saved, you were getting high, you done some things, maybe you stole from them when you was uh, uh, unsaved, but now you're trying to tell them, I'm not that person anymore. I don't, I don't trust you, you can't come around my house. You understand, that was me back in the day. No, 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 no. They won't let that go. Watch this now. Because they, don't, they won't let it go, don't you internalize what they do and how they treat me. I don't know who this is for. But but don't let them, don't let that was what they're saying to you about you and about your past. Don't let don't let the devil use that and say, you see, I told you. You don't see no difference in you. There's no difference at all. You gotta think about where you came from. You may you got high, not now. You got drunk. Maybe you was drinking, maybe you had a bottle last week, but you gave that up now. Maybe, maybe you, you're still struggling with some things. But watch this. I said this one time before, the Lord showed me something. If you're struggling with it, it's because you're not you're trying to fight against it and you're not in it, but the devil trying to suck you into it. What I suggest to you, you keep fighting until you get free. You keep fighting at, for the victory because you already have victory in Jesus. Remember, you're more than a conqueror. All right? So God will use people to, 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 so, that we, so that we can display humility. He also, watch this on the flip side, God will use difficult people to expose our hidden pride. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. He will use people. When we refuse to do things God's way. After God reveals to us what should be done. When we decide we're not going to let go, we're not going to be, we're not going to, to, to forgive, we're not going to be gracious people. When we, when we decide we're not going to show the love that God says. What, we are, what we're saying is, is that I put myself on a pedestal, I put myself in position, I am my own God. And I want to I want to punish those who I want to punish. I want to I want to be able to pronounce and declare on whoever I say is unworthy, I'm going to declare them to be unworthy, and you can't stop me from doing it. God says, I got to deal with you. I have to deal with you. Because you see, some people, 
not some people, those difficult people in our life, God can use to expose hidden pride. Notice what the Bible says in Proverbs 16 18. Pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Either you believe the word or not. If we are allowing ourselves to function in hidden pride, that our hearts are hardened to other people, even people who have done us wrong, if we have not learned to let them go and love them anyhow, and we decide we want to be judge and jury and executioner, remember God says, I am the judge. He says, I will repay. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. We have to let God be the judge. Let God be the one who makes the decision as to what will be done about them. And what we have to do is love and forgive. Without we, we cannot become what we what we despise. We say we don't like lies, but we lie. We don't say we don't like people who, who are always contrary. We don't like people who are argumentative, but that's what we're doing. We got to make sure that as, as we deal with difficult people, that we don't become difficult ourselves. Amen? So why is pride so sinful? Pride is giving ourselves the credit for something that God has accomplished. Pride, pride is taking the glory that belongs to God uh, alone and keeping it for ourselves. Pride is essentially, listen to me, self-worship. Anything we accomplish in this world would not have been possible were it not for God enabling and sustaining us. We could not do it without God. We cannot act right without God. We cannot think right without Jesus. We cannot think right without the Spirit of God. We cannot do right without the Spirit of God. We cannot pay our bills right. We can't treat our wives right. We can't treat our... I come to the conclusion, I can do nothing without God. But I'm so thankful that he said that through Christ we can do all things. So, so, so I know my time is about to run, but I got, I got a few minutes left. So, I already said... That difficult people, this is one thing I already talked about, difficult people will, will force you to your knees in prayer. I told you that's where you win your battles, right? Well, listen to this. Over in Nehemiah, one of my favorite books of the Bible. I love Nehemiah because he was a man of God, a man on a mission, and didn't let anything deter him. Even though there were enemies surrounding him, take time to read that book. He had enemies, he had Tobiah, he had Sabbath, he had the Arabians, he had Gershom, he had all these individuals surrounding him and trying to stop him from building the wall. But look what it says here in, in, in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7, 7 to 9. But when Sambalat, Tobiah, the, Ar the Arabs, the Arabs rather, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod were heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead. And that the gaps were being closed. They were very angry. The enemy hates to see you progress. He hates to see you moving forward. He's trying everything to stop your progress. And he's sending difficult, toxic people in your life to do that. But God will use those same people to get you to fall on your knees and watch and watch how God make a table before you. And the person of your enemy, you decide, I'm going to keep moving for God. Look at this. He says, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. They were trying to stop the work. But we prayed. <laughs> Notice what Nehemiah said. Nehemiah said. He said, but we, not only was Nehemiah a praying man, but he inspired others to do the same thing. But we, somebody say we, we prayed. That means the wife prayed with the husband. The husband prayed with the children. The husband and wife got together with the mom and the, and the grandma. They all got together and said, we're going to pray because we have enemies around us. But we're not going to stop the work because it's enemies. We're going to do the work in front of the enemies and let them see how God will still bless us when we decide that we're going to do God's, God, we're going to build what God says God's way. So we, we so the Bible says that they prayed. And when they did that, not only did they pray, but they said, and our God, we prayed to our God and posted a guard night, day, and night to meet this threat. I have to stop on that, that point right there. He said, we prayed. And, 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 and not only did we pray to our God, ensuring that God's power and strength will come down and funnel down to us, but we also made provision to fight 
to get out in position. I told y'all, you got to fight like a Christian. I told y'all, you're going to have to fight. So he said, we're going to be prepared to go to war if we have to physically, but, but we already have gone to war spiritually. I know there's a two sides to this thing. There's a spiritual side and a fleshly side. There's a spiritual side and a natural side. And as long as I'm in tune with the God that's in the spirit realm, I will be able to overcome those things in the natural realm. The problem is we have not connected the two. He said right there, we got together and we posted guards day and night to meet this threat. They prayed and they were prepared to go to battle. Difficult people come into our lives. And I'm not done. We still have some other things to talk about. But I have five minutes left. Well, less than that. Difficult people come into our lives. And God's saying there's a purpose for them. First of all, don't you become like them. Remember, that's where you came from. Don't go back. Stay in the ground. Don't change while you're in the midst of the battle. Don't throw up the, the white flag and surrender and become a part of another team. Amen? Know that if anything's going to be smoother, smoothed out, if anything's going to become smoother, it needs something rough to smooth it, smooth it out. Amen? And, and when we have these enemies surrounding us, this is not a time to start crying and wondering what to do. This is the time to fight for my knees. This is the time to put up the battle axe of Jesus Christ. It's time for us to say, you know, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. You got to say, you got to make a declarative statement that you are to win no matter what, no matter how many difficulties come in your life or how many difficult people surround your life. I am going to be the last one standing when it's all over because my God will give me the ability to stand. I hope you're hearing me. We got a lot to talk about. We got a lot to talk about. So I'm getting ready to just wrap this up and let you know where we're heading. We still, we still have to finish up because God says there's other things uh, that, they, that difficult people will teach us. He will teach us, watch this, to become, watch this, to receive criticism without becoming defensive. <laughs> Sometimes you, you, you have, there's some things have to be pointed out. And we have to learn how to listen before we speak. You got to be quick to hear and slow to speak. And sometimes people say stuff to us we don't like and we want to immediately start throwing back at them what they do wrong. God says, no, that's not the purpose. Sometimes you got to listen so you can get better. Amen? Let me wrap this up. So, again, I want to thank Pastor, Pastor Douglas for allowing me to, to be able to at least have these three weeks to be able to pour into your life. I know some things I went through kind of quickly, but I hope you got something from this. Because it's important that you that you that you hear what God is saying today. Amen. We need to be different. All right? And remember us on YouTube, share this. Facebook, share it. All our social media uh, 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 platforms, share it. And remember, we're here on Sunday morning in both locations. Amen. We're, we're live on both in both locations. So you're welcome to come and please send this out to everybody that you know. Amen. All the messages that, that's coming forth, send it out so that people can be blessed by what they hear. Amen. So let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for all that was said. We just give you all the praise and all the glory. I pray now in the name of Jesus that this word will find a lodging place in our hearts so we may not sin against you. We thank you and we're looking forward to next week, Lord, to be able to speak into the lives of your people. We're excited and I pray that everyone else become excited about you about this message, this lesson, about the people, the learning how to deal with difficult people, but without becoming a difficult one, but becoming one of ourselves. So we just give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.